Welcome to Cosmology Talks, everyone. Today we have Dylan Brout, who is a NASA Einstein Fellow at Harvard Smithsonian. He's talking about the recent Pentium Plus supernova catalog and specifically the cosmology results from it. I've been pestering Dylan about this since probably almost nine months ago, uh, trying to get this talk. And the, the shoes one that you saw last December was actually a fortuitous um, result of, of this, that pestering. This was the, the main talk I was aiming at. The, the goal was to record it before the paper went out so that the video could go live with the paper. Unfortunately, that, that didn't happen, but I think Dylan has about as good an excuse as you can possibly have that literally about an hour before we were due to start recording, his wife went into labor. So I think we can all agree that Dylan has his priorities correct and he canceled the recording with me. Luckily for Dylan, he did manage to get the paper out 24 hours before the labor. So congratulations, Dylan, on both the paper and the, uh, the new arrival in the family. Do you want to start by telling us briefly about your paper? <laughs> We've been working towards this Pantheon Plus cosmology result for, you know, you could go back as far as five years, but really the, the, the final push has been, no pun intended, the last two or so years. And it's been something like 10 different papers leading up to this analysis. And so it's been a really big culmination of effort and data wrangling and hopefully gets used by a lot of the people in the community. If there were only two things that people remember from the paper or the talk six months or a year from now, what would you want those things to be? One of the things that we really wanted to communicate in the paper is, was the great detail that we went into on investigating all possible sources of systematic uncertainty that we could possibly think of and that the community has helped us think of over the last five or so years since the original Pantheon analysis. So this is like now well over a hundred different sources of systematic uncertainty and we've made significant efforts to compile multiple samples in order to effectively beat down certain aspects of the systematic uncertainties that plague type 1a supernova analyses. And so that's in combination with the, the, the great care that we've gone into and the dedication to compiling many surveys, we believe that this is one of the most robust analyses to date. It's, it's worth noting that surveys like the upcoming Vera Rubin LSST supernova survey plan on doing cosmology potentially with data from solely a single telescope or primarily from the Vera Rubin Observatory. And so that means that they have to really nail down their systematics phenomenally well because the plan at the moment is to not combine multiple different data sets um, as we've done here. So these are two different phenomenologies of how to go about doing a cosmology analysis with supernovae. Before you get to the second one, I guess this is a bit tangential, but your catalog is of supernovae over quite a few years or even decades, right? But LST can't look at a supernova that stopped emitting light 20 years ago. Is the rate high enough that they'll actually have a meaningful number of... There's two pieces to, to what you're saying, I think, which is the rates aspect. And so, yes, we've compiled data over the last 20 years, but LSST will find many more because even though it's only going to be five or so year survey, it's going to be covering a much larger volume of the sky. So it's going to have potentially hundreds of thousands of type 1a supernovae to investigate. But it, as you said, can't see the ones that have already happened. So for the analyses like the shoes analysis that we are sort of analogous to, those very nearby supernovae where you're volume limited are gone. And so measurements, for example, of the Hubble constant in the traditional distance ladder method that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago will not necessarily be improved via future telescopes. Those are much more volume limited. And so it will take more time for those analyses to mature. So the new thing about LSST is essentially it's seeing them further away, but dimmer further away and more sort of angle on the sky. So there have been surveys like the ongoing DES analysis, dark energy survey, that will see roughly as far as LSST is going to see. LSST will go a little bit farther, but it's a much smaller area on the sky. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. So I'll let you get to a, your second of the two things. So the second aspect, which I've kind of hinted upon already, is that Pantheon Plus, which is, I'll try to be careful while we're talking to not call it Pantheon because it's the update to Pantheon. Pantheon Plus is tied at the hip with the shoes analysis that you've heard about where the, it, that involves the distance ladder methodology of measuring the Hubble constant. So now the way that we've essentially partnered together with the shoes team, we are now analyzing the second and third rungs of the distance ladder simultaneously 
with all of the nuisance parameters and the cosmological parameters. And so that means that the shoe's measurement in the shoe's paper is not really independent from the Pantheon plus supernovae. They're tied at the hip, and we characterize that, and we will provide the data that will allow you to take advantage of that. So yeah, okay, the next question is, is why you did this. Maybe some papers that are self-explanatory, but you can tell us your own perspective of that. Maybe why, why is this paper also coming out now and not three or four years ago? What needed to happen before you could get to this point? So, okay, yeah, there's the motivational aspect of why we did this. And then there is the logistical, you could call it, aspect of why we felt now was the right time to do this. So motivationally, we want to know what is the cause of the acceleration of the universe? And is it dark energy? How would we describe it? Is it the energy of the vacuum? Is it consistent with a cosmological constant or something else? Is dark energy possibly evolving? We have these two outstanding, what we call cosmological constant problems, or I shouldn't say we, Steven Weinberg called them the two cosmological constant problems. Those being that the observed cosmological constant is 122 orders of magnitude smaller than the theoretical expectation. And then the second one, which is not discussed as often, which is why is it so that the dark energy density or relative contribution in the universe is a very similar magnitude to that of the matter and ordinary baryonic matter and dark matter density. And so is that a coincidence or is that something else? To clarify that even further, that's almost an anthropic coincidence thing, right? Because it's not always the same. A long time ago, it was much smaller because... That's right. And a long time in the future, it'll be much larger. So why is it like that today when we're making observations? Yes, exactly. Some people are less keen on that one because because um, it's an anthropic one. Sure, yes, you right. So the, the more talked about one, the more famous problem that we're dealt with is the first one, which is this hundred orders of magnitude issue, for sure. The last sort of motivational piece is we have this test that is we, what we call the end-to-end -end test of cosmology, where we can compare the Hubble constant, which is the expansion rate of the universe, from data measured at the time of recombination, and compare it using some model for the universe, the Lambda CDM model, a standard cosmological model. We can compare that to a measurement of the expansion rate today and compare the two over 14 billion years of cosmic history and see if they match up. And so at the moment, they don't appear that they do. And so this is yet further motivation to investigate why, especially because Type 1a supernovae play a central role in this. And, and just I have to add my, my caveat that I always add when people say they don't match up it's over an extrapolation of many orders of magnitude. One number gives of order 74, the other number gives of order 67. When, when we're extrapolating by 10 to the power of, what is it, like nine halves from the CMB down to now. So the cosmological model isn't like a disaster that's getting it wildly wrong. It's, it's like throwing a dart at the dartboard many kilometers away and just missing the bullseye. Sure, it missed bullseye but it got pretty close, so. That's right. Something in my heart wants to say that it's such an incredible feat that we've come this close. The problem is that the further we look into our uncertainties, and that's what essentially is the takeaway from these papers recently, is understanding the uncertainties, because that's what really telling us if we have a crisis on our hands or not. The fact that we've come close, yes, is, is amazing. I, I agree with that. <laughs> you've concentrated a lot in this intro so far on just the, the background expansion. You do so do some kind of sneaky structure formation stuff based on the peculiar velocities of the supernova as well. Are you planning on talking about that at all today or? If not, not so much today. Um, it's sort of a kind of a foray into what we think the future is gonna be. There's a number of different low redshift surveys that are ongoing and planned. And so we wanted to start showing what kind of things are possible for measuring the local structure of the universe, searching for deviations from expectations and peculiar velocities and stuff like that. We don't make any conclusive statements, so it's not necessarily worth highlighting, but it is sort of a, a bit of a motivation for these upcoming surveys, I think. I, I mean, I, I just, yeah, I, I guess I find that quite exciting because it's um, because of the fact that they're standard candles and so that you can kind of know their distance really well. I guess you have to assume the cosmological model to say that it's a peculiar velocity rather than a, an expansion velocity. But Depending on how low redshift you are, you can potentially be in the linear regime and not worry as much about your cosmological model. But yes, it's, it's, a, it's a delta. Yeah. Which is really cool because you then you, you get this direct measurement of the velocity, which you're assuming, probably quite right, has to be some sort of gravitational attraction to some nearby well. So you're, you're kind of directly measuring the local gravitational 
that's right. And we, we use maps of these, you know, of the structure of the local universe, and it's incorporated into our analysis already. So what we're looking at is actually like a delta on top of a delta. So it's a, it's a bit hard to extrapolate. It's worth, I think what we, we're trying to motivate is worth more study. So your second question, or how I would address what motivated us in, in another way is sort of logistically speaking, why didn't we do some of the things in 2018? Why now? Which is that there has been incredible leaps in understanding of type 1a supernova analyses in the last five years. And it's, it just boils down to that. And hopefully I'll get to talk to you about a couple of those today and how when you combine them all together and then the fact that we have added two large data sets that have been released since 2018. All of that combined results in a factor of two improvement in the figure of merit or the, the constraining power of cosmological parameters. So for most cosmologists, you would hear a factor of two figure of merit and you would be very skeptical because it's huge. And so we felt we needed to address this. We needed to build confidence in what's happening in the supernova community. We needed to set the stage for LSST, which is coming up very soon. So we felt like this was the right time to get this out there. And then lastly, a lot of the community has given lots of great comments on how the shoes and analysis and the original Pantheon analysis could be improved. And we felt like we could address most, if not all of those. And that was one of our other main goals. And we wanted to get that out there as soon as possible. So what questions were unsolved that you wanted uh, or needed to solve? Dating back to 2018, I am also part of the Dark Energy Survey collaboration. And we released a supernova analysis where we identified that the largest sources of systematic uncertainty at the time plaguing 1A analyses were related to supernova astrophysics that specifically related to the colors of the supernovae and how they are understood in our model. Essentially, what myself and my collaborator Dan Skolnick did was boil down the biggest problems in supernova cosmology at the time to three main questions. Those being, what drives the observed supernova colors and color luminosity relations? That is the relations that allow you to standardize the supernovae, because we know that type 1a supernovae are not perfect standard candles, they are standardizable candles. And the second question is, what drives the underlying residual scatter of the standardized supernovae? And then the last question is, what's driving the evidence for additional standardization beyond what we call the trip equation. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. So the first mystery relates to the specific colors and color luminosity relations. So we have these models for the supernova colors, which are shown on the left. And they are these sort of asymmetric models for the populations of the colors. You know, so if you want to simulate a set of supernovae, you need an asymmetric population to draw from as you simulate the supernovae. And what you'll notice is it's extended on the right-hand side or the red side. So that's one thing. Now look at the plot on the right side. What this is, is effectively the color luminosity relation after you've taken out a single best fit color luminosity relation. So it's the residual to a single color luminosity relation. And what you can see is there's effectively a kink. There's like two slopes here. And what that's saying is you have a different color luminosity relation for the supernovae on the left-hand side of the plot compared to the supernovae on the right-hand side of the plot, where these data points here are binned. So there's hundreds of supernovae in this plot, and the black points just show the averages. So I guess you've got some arbitrary color as your zero on this. It seems to be that to the red side of that, it's doing quite well, and to the blue side, it's not. Right, right. So the question is, how do you explain this? It looks like there's two color laws going on here, if you just look at sort of a big picture. Okay, let's leave it at that and let's look at the second mystery. What is driving the underlying scatter in the standardized supernovae? So we put these supernovae on the Hubble diagram after performing our standardization. And what we find is the measurement uncertainties are not enough to describe the amount of scatter that we observe in the Hubble diagram. And so we need to add in some more scatter. And there are models that have existed for over a decade on how to do this. Some are like gray scatter, color independent scatter, and then some are more color dependent scatter. 
These are actually spectral based models, but what they do is they describe the amount of intrinsic scatter of the type 1a supernovae, that is after we've done the standardization. And that's described by these dashed blue lines here. It's quite large, it's about 10%. And in putting together the Pantheon Plus data set, we notice something rather drastic, which is that if we plot the residual scatter in the Hubble diagram as a function of the color, again, a lot of these plots come back to the color, as I mentioned, the scatter increases with color. And so in the past, for example, in the original Pantheon or the joint light curve analysis, which was the predecessor to Pantheon, a single number was assumed here in this plot. Now we're showing evidence. In fact, it's whopping evidence, 11 sigma, that it's not a single number and that the scatter is in fact color dependent. So why would that be? And why would the largest amount of scatter be for the reddest supernovae? So that's the second mystery. And then the third is this evidence for additional standardization in the Hubble diagram. This has been seen back again, going back a decade and recent cosmological analyses have added an additional parameter to the standardization equation or the equation that we use to get the distance moduli, where this extra parameter is an observed correlation between the residual brightness and uh, host galaxy property. And so this was first seen as a function of stellar mass of the host galaxy and has been seen many times since. It's a little hard to see, but it's there. It's there at many sigma. Various analyses have seen it to varying degrees of significance. And that's actually an important point here is that I'll hopefully, hopefully be able to communicate, but the fact that they haven't been seen to the same significance in every analysis is not a worry based on how I'm going to explain this. But it's also been seen as a function of other parameters like the host color or the specific star formation rate or the local specific star formation rate. And it's been a de debate for the past 10 or so years over which is the best parameter to use. And if that parameter is the most indicative or the, has the strongest signal, well, that must tell you about the physics that's going on to cause this. And so if you claim that it's based on the host color or based on the lo local specific star formation rate, you would have a different interpretation for what is causing this correlation physically. Can I just interrupt with maybe a naive question? Remembering back to the shoes discussion, the whole kind of issue is that there's only 40 or so supernovae where you also have Cepheids to do the calibration. There seem to be a heck of a lot more than 40 data points here. H how do you know the intrinsic luminosity without that calibration to, to know what you're scattering around? Often it is relative to Lambda CDM. You can do it in bins of redshift. So you could do it and say, uh, if I pick a small bin in redshift and maybe take out a small trend, a linear trend, as long as the bin in redshift is small enough, you would have a number of supernovae in that bin that you could assume are all at the same distance relative to some linear fit. Um, that is your quote unquote cosmology. And then you can look at the scatter. But to put it simply, the y axis here is distance minus the model distance where the model distance is lambda CDM. We, do, we don't typically worry too much about the model dependence here though. The model dependence arises when you have your x axis, your host galaxy properties that change with redshift. That's when you start to worry that the parameter that you're using to do this extra standardization has some, that you're introducing some redshift dependence that you may or may not want to be introducing. And when you then do the actual, say, H naught measurement, this additional stuff is not going into it? Yeah, so it is. It had, in the past, it had been. Um, it was done based on host galaxy mass. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is a great point. So as you said, there are only 40 Cepheid calibrator supernovae, or back in 2016, there were only, a, you know, 18 or 20. And so we use the correlations that we see in the Hubble flow set and apply them to the calibrator set. Okay, but with relatively large error bars because of the small number of supernovae in that 16 or 20 or 40 supernova sample. The, the, yes, the, 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 the effective shift in the mean is small considering that the error bars are large. Yes, I think I, if I understand what you're saying. The other important thing to note is that because this has been brought up as a potential systematic for H naught many times, um, so this is, this is important for us to address. But what we do in the analysis now is for the Hubble flow set, now this is specifically for the shoes measurement, not for the, for the measurement in the paper that we're talking about today, but for the shoes measurement, what uh, Adam Reese does is he takes the Hubble flow set and trims it down to have the 
most similar host galaxy demographics as possible that he can get to match the calibrator set of hosts. So that even if you got some of these correlations wrong, as long as the demographics for the calibrator hosts in the second rung of the distance ladder are similar to the demographics in the third rung of the distance ladder, it effectively cancels out. So you're only sensitive to the fact that things may change between the different rungs of the distance ladder, or another way of saying it is that if your demographics change as a function of redshift. If early galaxies are somehow different to late galaxies or something like that. Right, yes, and that's, that's the concern here. That's what Mikel Rigo brought up here, is the selection effect that happens for the shoes sample in specific star formation rate. But we think that we saw this in a different way, and that is pretty convincing to us. And the aha moment came from this plot, again, as we were compiling the Pantheon Plus data set. We found that the mass step is consistent with zero on the left-hand side of this plot for the bluest supernovae. Again, this is binned data. And then on the right-hand side of the plot, it's the strongest. So there's a color dependence to the mass step. Um, and that, that, that only the reddest supernovae are showing these residual correlations with brightness and host galaxy properties. So how do we explain this all? And this is the work of myself and Dan Skolnick in a paper we wrote in 20, last year. <laughs> so we address these three key mysteries. The, the mystery of why is there this red tail for the colors, which you can see in the top. And we say this can be explained by dust. Why is the scatter in the standardized brightnesses larger as you go redder? And we say that can be also explained by dust, specifically variation in the dust law values and extinction parameters. And then lastly, we say that the fact that there's two color luminosity relations suggests that there is a different color luminosity relation that is intrinsic to the supernova, which is the blue side, the, the unextinguished undusted up supernovae, and uh, that is a different color luminosity relation than the dust of the galaxy or a potentially circumstellar environment that gives you the two laws there. So that sort of begs the question, if we know this, and we know that what we call the SALT2 model, which is the model that we use to fit the supernova light curves, assumes a single dust law, it assumes a mean extinction and it, assume, it assumes a single supernova color luminosity relation, which is this beta parameter here. Why are we still doing this if we know this now? And it's always been a concern of supernova cosmology. It's, you know, in any area of cosmology, frankly, you're always concerned about dust. Um, so it's not a surprise. And the question is, why don't we break this term up into a dust term, which has the dust extinction law and the dust extinction itself? and then an intrinsic color and an intrinsic color luminosity relation. And the answer is, well, at low redshift with high signal to noise data at, at wider wavelengths, maybe that's possible and some surveys have attempted to do this. But as you go to higher redshift, you only have a couple photometric bands. And certainly for the future surveys like LSST, this is just not feasible. It's these parameters are degenerate with each other with just a couple of photometric bands. But what we were able to do in the paper is model the full distribution. So maybe not on a supernova by supernova basis we can do this, but we can do it by modeling the full distribution of supernova that we observe, doing some kind of forward modeling. So that's what this is showing here. It's a two component model. It's the intrinsic component of the supernova, which I'm showing here. The intrinsic component is this simple distribution of color, it's a Gaussian. Um, you see that the distribution in the teal here does not describe what we see fully. It's only one piece. And it sets the color luminosity relation on the left-hand side over here. And then when we combine the dust distribution, which is a one-sided extinction-only distribution, it sets the color luminosity relation here. It sets this asymmetry of the color histogram. And I think most excitingly, it sets the increased scatter as a function of color where this is coming from the fact that in our simulations, we allow each galaxy to have a different dust law. Can I, can I just, as a theoretical cosmologist, ask some dusty questions? Um, why is it that it has this sharp cutoff? Is it that the dust is absorbing the supernova light and then like re-emitting it in a slightly longer wavelength? That's right. It's, it's, it, doesn't, it, it never goes bluer. Sure, but why is it not absorbing stuff at minus 0.2 and re-emitting it at minus 0.15? Oh, these are convolved. The location of this distribution is um is I, I think i get what you mean it 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 will take whatever frequency of light it was absorbed 
and it will the sharp cutoff is at that frequency and then it will emit light this is what it will look like for a single starting color but really this is happening at every mm -hmm. possible color so it is it is absorbing at minus 0.2 and emitting at minus 0.15 i see okay and then when you combine the two you get a simulation that matches the data so you get this beautiful asymmetric color histogram you get the scatter as a function of color and you get the two color laws so the the last piece of the puzzle is why is there this host correlation. And once you have this model, you can start to input different host galaxy properties and see what pops out. And that's what we did. So the plot on the left I've shown you, but now I'm showing you with our new model applied and we can explain the color dependence of the mass step. The same information is being shown here. These are residuals in the Hubble diagram. The data has been split on low and high mass. And so what you see is low and high mass galaxies agree when you are dealing with unextinguished supernovae. So that's the same thing as saying there is no mass step. And as you go redder, the mass step grows. And that's what we're seeing here. And you can describe that in our models now, our simulations of the data set, by saying there's a different average dust attenuation law for high mass galaxies than there is for low mass galaxies. And that is our explanation for the mass step and its color dependence. And why is that? Is it that the more massive ones have more dust or the dust is more sucked into the center of the galaxy? Or Yeah, that's, that's not totally clear. And I think <laughs> that might be beyond my pay grade. I think you should call in someone like um, Salim. He wrote a really great paper on this. I think it's not fully understood why, but it has been seen. And now since we've released this paper, it's been confirmed with other supernova analyses and um, I know of a couple of other ongoing galaxy-only analyses to, to investigate the dust attenuation law as a function of host galaxy properties. It's also worth mentioning that mass does not have to be the answer here. Just correlated to mass. It's just correlated with mass, and we were able to fit the distributions of dust to the mass. If you found a parameter that better traces the dust, I would highly suggest that we use that. But this is what we did here. So in summary, the Hubble residuals correlate with the properties of the host galaxies because there are different dust laws for different types of galaxies. The 10% scat intrinsic scatter or the standardization floor is due to the fact that we have a varied distribution of dust laws that we don't account for in our supernova model currently because they're degenerate. And lastly, how does color relate to luminosity? Well, we have an intrinsic color component that is a relatively small component of the model compared to the relation that's dominated by dust. This model makes predictions, so we have already been putting it to the test, and it seems to be holding up. There have been a number of analyses that kind of go different directions with it, but I would argue that it's going to it's going to hold up. I, is is this stuff on dust? It's not actually in the Pantheon Plus Cosmology paper. It's in some of those earlier ones. No, it's in one of the supporting papers. It's one in the yeah. It's in Brout and Skolnick 2021. But it's one of the main reasons why we wanted to redo Pantheon. And now that you have redone it and, and solved the dust and gotten more supernovae and everything else, uh, yeah, what, what were the cosmological results in this paper from, what was it, January or February? So what this amounts to is the largest Hubble diagram to date. Uh, we put on reference here this subset that the shoes sample uses. And so really, it's important to note that there's a lot more than what shoes is using, because as I said, they trim down their data set to be most similar between the second and third rungs. But we also do our own measurements of H0, which I'll show you in a second with the full set. Here is our covariance matrix. This is something that I would like the community to be aware of, which is that with the original Pantheon, I think you could get away with not using the covariance matrix that the original Pantheon provided. Now, with the necessity to d deal with the systematic uncertainties very carefully with these analyses, it's important to use the covariance matrix. Also, because we are using 1,701 light curves of 1,550 distinct supernovae in this analysis, you actually need the covariance matrix even to do any kind of fit. Otherwise, you'll end up double counting because there's there's a, like 150 duplicate supernovae that we have multiple light curves of the same supernova. And that makes for really interesting analyses of how well different surveys can measure the same supernova. How well can we measure the same supernova? It's a, it's a nice cross check, but that means you have to use this. But that data is not available just yet. No, it's not. Not yet. Not yet. It will be, though. 
So this is our constraints on lambda CDM where we do not require flatness. So the amount of matter in the universe, the energy density of a cosmological constant, and our constraints are here in the red. And you can see here they agree well with the constraints from BAO and from Planck. And they indicate an accelerating universe at many sigma. And Planck gives us evidence for flat universe, but really it's, it's extremely flat when you combine it with supernovae. And then one other thing I'll point out with this plot, which may have been pointed out by others before, is that type 1a supernovae are often one of the first probes to be attacked in terms of whether or not the universe is accelerating, perhaps because they were the first to discover the accelerating universe, but also perhaps because they're one of the more accessible ones, I think, um, to get a hold of data and get started quickly. And this plot is a reminder that if you're going to make a claim that the universe is not accelerating, you have to explain everything that's going on here. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the most viewed, I think it might be the second or third most viewed talk on the channel by uh, Eva Maria Mueller was about the EBOS result. It might even be this SDS SDR 16 BAO plot you've put here, but the, the conclusion was essentially that BAO alone requires an accelerating universe. No, no Planck, no supernovae, which, so, so you, you know, it, <laughs> it's a difficult job to, that, that, that helps us sleep at night, for sure. The story of concordance cosmology is just this remarkable consistency that, that is going on here, um, and with other probes, um, emerging probes as well. One thing I'll note is that the value for Omega Matter has shifted a little bit from the original Pantheon. That's coming from the additional data, and it's coming from a number of analysis methodology changes, but no significant shifts beyond what, for example, was quoted in terms of the systematic uncertainty in the original Pantheon. So nothing crazy. So there was some discordance creeping into this plot that I'm not seeing in, in the one you've shown. Has the Pantheon data moved just a little bit towards Planck to remove that discordance or? It's moved towards higher omega matter. Yeah. So I think if that's what you're talking, I, I don't remember there being a quote unquote discordance, but it's, yeah, it's, it has moved a little bit towards higher omega matter. In the paper, we show our data set with and without shoes. So you can see the constraints that we have, and they're essentially the same, except when you add shoes, you get the constraint on H0. So it, the red contour here for H0 goes from huge to a very good constraint on H0. And what you can see is agreement with a cosmological constant in this blue contour, which is what happens when we combine with Planck. But when you look at H0, you can see disagreement. And then we are also measuring WA, the evolution of dark energy. And that's one of the big points of this paper is that, same with the previous plot, we are measuring the cosmological model from the Pantheon Plus supernovae and the Cepheid Calibrator supernovae simultaneously to measure H0, the nuisance parameters, and your whatever your cosmological model may be. And so that's what we've sort of done here. And, and what it shows is that for example, if you were to analyze Pantheon and shoes, the teal, and Planck separately and allow for evolution of dark energy, you would find that potentially the gray and the teal could overlap and it could potentially solve the h tension. tension. But that's not the full story because what we've now allowed is to combine the data sets so you can measure them simultaneously without doubling up on the supernovae. It's essentially allowing the supernovae to then constrain many of the degenerate parameters in the Planck likelihood. And so what you're left with is the blue contour when you combine Pantheon and Planck, you get a blue contour that is no longer consistent with an H-naught of 73. So the, the, the supernovae will take away that freedom of WA, the evolution of dark energy, so that it can no longer solve the H-naught tension. So the supernovae are evolving in time exactly how Lambda CDM says they should. Yes, and so that is, that is equivalent to saying, and so to some this will not be a surprise, that in Lambda CDM there's H0 tension, and the Pantheon, super, Pantheon plus supernovae are consistent with Lambda CDM. So it's, it is not terribly surprising. Sure, but, but this is examining it from a new direction and seeing that same thing. Yeah, yeah, and this I think should hopefully set the stage for how future analyses will go in terms of if you're going to try and propose a model that resolves the tension, you now have all the tools to, to do this all simultaneously. But, but yeah, but it looks like it, it's tricky, at least with just 
vanilla extensions to Lambda CDM like W and WA, that there will be the supernovae evolving like a cosmological constant are too, um, too constraining. We just show, these are this, essentially the same plots, but now we're zooming in and we're including BAO. And you see that using the best available data sets, public data sets, we find consistency with the cosmological constant, W of minus one, and a WA consistent with zero at two sigma, which we're not saying anything is there. So, you know, take with that what you wish. Well, cosmologists love the two sigmas, but uh, it's interesting, Pantheon plus plus Planck, Seems consistent with Lambda CDM, Pentium plus plus shoes is, I mean, I guess it's not making a statement about Lambda CDM too. Oh no, no, it is. And it's consistent with Lambda CDM. So it's, it's plank and shoes that are literally that end to end that is not, um, not matching. Where do we go next? Where do you go as Dylan? Where does Pantheon go as Pantheon? And where should the cosmology community go as the cosmology community? So the, the next thing on my to-do list is, uh, the dark energy survey set of 2000 roughly photometrically classified supernovae. This is a, a marked shift from what we've been doing with Pantheon Plus, which are all spectroscopically classified supernovae. But um, the team in the Dark Energy Survey has made really big strides on understanding the impact of photometric classification um, and machine learning models that do that. And we think that we're going to be able to make as good, if not better, constraints than Pantheon Plus, which is also exciting. Beyond that, I mean, DES is really a, a proving ground for LSST. So then, then once that's out, which is hopefully in the coming year, possibly, we'll shift gears to LSST. And is a uh, machine learning photometric redshift using as its training data spectroscopically confirmed redshift? Uh, yeah, sorry, just to clarify, photometrically classified supernova types so 1a 1bc type 2 that's that sort of stuff yeah in both of these analyses and i believe the plan for the main lsst analysis is to use spectroscopic redshifts all over the place but it's the it's the classification of the supernovae to get the 1a's that the, those standard candles ah i see so so the actual light curve of a supernova that goes off on the sky is not always easily chosen as type 1a like like as a human being we can't always just be like ah, obviously that's a 1a and obviously that's something else you know it's funny i've noticed i'm maybe i'm like in the middle but certainly some of the younger supernova cosmologists couldn't identify a super a 1a light curve by eye but definitely some people like adam or older people that have been in this game for a while and prior to machine learning know what a 1a curve looks like but the reality is the telescopes are pushing the limits of signal to noise. And so everything starts to look similar when you have a couple bands and a couple data points. And so to really eke the most out of your data set, which we may or may not have to do when we have 100,000 supernovae, that, that's a decision that will have to be made. But at the moment, for example, in DES, we try to get the most out of it. And yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to see by eye. And so the idea would be then not to use the machine learning to say, these are 100% definitely a, super, a type 1a supernova, but somehow like there's an 80% probability that this is, so then we include it. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. It makes the analyses difficult in other ways. Like if you wanna measure structure, for example, as we were talking about, you have to propagate those probabilities into your analyses carefully. It just adds a layer of complexity, but it's the way of the future. Yeah, I know they do similar stuff in um, galaxy clusters with the sunyer zaldovich effect that sometimes it could just be a random CMB fluctuation, sometimes it could be a galaxy cluster of a certain mass. And if it is a galaxy cluster, it has this mass, but it might not be. And so you factor in that and in a kind of full cosmological analysis. Yeah, any, any other thoughts about what the community should, I guess once the data is public, should use it, but other than that, continue worrying about the H0 tension. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, we welcome this process. It's it's nerve wracking, but it's important. So keep sending us your messages for what you think could be hiding in our data and we'll investigate it with you if you'd like. One thing we didn't do here is investigate exotic models. There's papers out there like the paper by Sasha Brownsberger that investigate exotic oscillating dark energy models. We didn't do anything like that. We didn't do any late time models like were done by Sohail Dewan and uh, I think a group, someone in Wayne Who's group did. With the original Pantheon, a lot of those late time effects have been effectively ruled out. When you say late time, it, it, when one's comparing end to end, late time in some sense could be everything under a shift 100, but, but are you meaning like really, really late time? Y yeah, uh, you, 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, so by late time, you just it's, so something happening at reach of five would still be late time when you're saying late time, or do you mean like point zero one? When I was saying late time, I meant like redshift point oh one. But yeah, when you're talking about an end-to-end test, it could matter uh, at redshift two. But it also depends on what you're calibrating to. So we've seen analyses where the supernovae are effectively calibrated to the BAO scale set by the sound horizon, and you can do sort of an inverse distance ladder and you get a low H naught. So there you could test some exotic expansion history that could potentially make a difference at redshift. Well, where is the BAO scale? Like 0.5. So that I would also call late time. But but anyways, my point was, yeah, it, it just a lot of these different, more exotic models for anything below redshift two, we, we haven't really looked at other than just depart, a single departure from Lambda CDM, which we don't see evidence for. So it would be surprising if something was there, but it's important for people to look. Yeah, I mean, I guess when you say you don't see evidence for it, you don't see evidence for it in Pantheon Planck, and you don't see evidence for it in Pantheon Plus Shoes, but the fact that the two are different is, of course, evidence for some sort of deviation. What work being done in cosmology at the moment do you think is particularly underappreciated by the community? That's a tough question. It's hard to say. I think the general sentiment that I feel is that there's been a lot of effort looking towards the future, big, massive, giant telescopes, and a lot of effort going towards that, a lot of money going towards that. And it's, it's incredibly important that that happens and that the pipelines are developed and the, the expertise in the instruments are developed. But I think it's important to remember that there can be a lot learned from combing through these data sets, compiling them like we did for Pantheon Plus, that have shown us that we may need to rethink some of the most important aspects of what's going to plague a potential future LSST analysis. And we've made progress for Pantheon Plus, we're making progress for DES. And so there's really nothing more valuable, in my opinion, than working with real data. I think it's important for everyone to get their hands on real data at some point. That's that's just what I sort of preach. But even if I can make a simulation and I get, instead of 40 supernovae or 2,000 supernovae, I can get 100,000, that it's in, in some sense, you're not really going to get something that you didn't expect. Right. Because I knew I was God. I put the laws of physics in. Whereas if I analyze even just a few hundred real supernovae, at least I know that they are representative of the real world because they were found in the real world. I see. That's a good point. Thanks everyone for watching. If you like this, please do subscribe and click the bell if you want to be notified of new videos and click like to help with YouTube algorithms to help this channel and to help yourself because if you click like, YouTube will recommend more stuff like this to you. If you have any questions or suggestions, please leave a comment. And uh, other than that, thanks Dylan for the, for the great talk. Yeah, thank you. Very nice.